Today's episode, we get into the occult. We also get into people who think God is talking to him and have the surname Bear. <laughs> this is the story of the San Francisco witch killers. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan. With me as always is Les. How's it going, dude? All good, man. Are you having a good day? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Smiling? Mm-hmm. Nodding your head? Mm-hmm. Can you say anything else except for mm-hmm? Yeah. No, you meant to go mm-hmm then. That's the joke. Yeah, I thought I'd, thought I'd be meta. Ruined it. Meta like Mark Zuckerberg. So, hello and welcome. Yes, um, today's episode is on the San Francisco Witch Killers. Um, it's going to be a fun one. This is Les. You've not heard much about it, have you? Nope. It's good. It's got a cult. It's got cults. It's got killings. It's got everything that you like. Bears. Not bears. Not bears. Just people called bears. Just people with the surname bear given to them by God. But yes, before we get into that, guys, remember this year we are raising money for Refuge, the domestic violence charity. If you do wish to donate for us, you can do by going to justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash enter the dark please donate i'm going to be shaving my head leslie's going to be doing stuff we might wax you i'm thinking like wax your chest and stuff because you don't want your hair shaved cool so you up for that waxing your chest good that's a yes his silence spoke volumes there you all heard it um yeah so we'll be doing that and also there's going to be loads of stuff live streams everything so if you just want to give like any of your money you can do. It doesn't even have to be your money. You know, steal it and give it to us. I don't care. Right. Also, speaking of stealing money, if you want to give it to us some more, you can do by going to Patreon and helping us get these episodes out quicker. All you have to do is go to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark and you can give us anything from $1 all the way up to $50 for 10 of your American freedom dollars. If you want to give us that. And you also get to choose a case for us. Also, you also get um, free T-shirts and stickers and mugs and stuff like that. It's dead good. You just, get, you just give us money and you get this stuff every few months. Awesome, innit? Speaking of Patreon, though, let me give a shout out from the big blue book of stickers. We have Hannah Blue, blue Harrington, Amanda Champagne, Staria Crowley, Amy Emmer and Jack Coleman, Sasha Johnson, Lisa Dempsey, Marie T. Jensen, Casey the Cannibal, Misty Day, Becky Louise, Izzy from the Clink, Jules Henderson, James Harrington, Mr. Crow, Richard Vaccarelli, Michelle Hudson and Alicia Lou Allen. Thank you all. <sighs> so then, Les, mm -hmm. are you ready to get into this? Oh, yeah. Right then. So... We're going to start off with Suzanne Barnes. Now, <clears throat> she seemed destined for something chaotic when she was born. She was born in 1941, and her earliest memories were formed by news events unfolding in World War II. However, Suzanne's family enjoyed a level of comfort thanks to her father's job as a newspaper executive. The war coverage also sold papers, and her family reaped the financial rewards. Is that war profiteering? Mm. Not really, is Not it? Not really, no. It's not like bonds, is it? No. But they're probably saying buy bonds in the newspaper. Probably. Yeah. Anyway, despite the ongoing war, the Barnes family were a picture of American success. Suzanne spent her childhood in an idyllic Arizona country club, swimming pools, making the most of the warm desert climate. Suzanne lived a charmed life, but behind closed doors, she struggled with mental distress. Suzanne experienced voices and visions, which she insisted came from her psychic powers. Young Suzanne built her identity around what she believed was the psychic power, what her psychic powers give to her. The visions and voices that played out in her head were glimpses into the past and the future. These supposed predictive powers made the world feel different. Suzanne, the people around her, glimmered with after images only she could see and echoed with voices audible only to her. Even at a young age, the second sight made her feel separate from other children, and she knew she was special. Now, her claims of visions and voices were dismissed by those around her. It was clear that she wasn't like the other kids, and she behaved oddly, and this further alienated her from her classmates. 
As a result, Suzanne was withdrawn at school and her stunted social development dovetailed with academic difficulties. Now, it must have felt like there was an endless series of roadblocks seen for her, preventing her from having a normal childhood and things at home weren't any better. She felt detached from her wealthy family and the privileged circles in which they moved. Though she probably wanted for nothing, she never got quite the hang of being a prim, proper child of wealth. So, you know, well, you see these people like a nanny. You know what I mean? She'd be like the orphan nanny. Just, you know, getting around singing. Saying like, wow, this is a big house. Daddy wore books and stuff like that. You're not seeing Annie. Yeah, so you know what I mean? She wasn't the prim proper girl, was she? Neither was Annie. Exactly, that's why I say she's like Annie. You're not listening to me again, are you? I am listening. He's not listening. Suzanne felt not like Annie. What? I guess it's not, she's not like, she's like Annie as in she's not that child. ginger curls. No, it doesn't matter the appearance wise. I'm on about fucking her situation. And he was adopted by Daddy Warbucks, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he was like, oh, he rented a child for a bit. It's a bit weird when you think She met, that. what's his name, didn't she? Who? The president in the wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roosevelt. Yeah, FDR. FDR, that's the one. Yeah, and, you know, she helped shape Daddy Warbucks from a big... I wonder if he lost all his money in the Depression. The Depression was before that. Oh, was it? Yeah. All right. Uh, he profiteered. Anyway, but that doesn't mean that she didn't try to fit the in. The Depression pretty much caused World War II in a way. What year was Annie Sutton? Well, they were on about war bonds and stuff, so it would have been like in the 1940s. The Depression was because, like, America, like, bailed out Germany, like, because they had to pay back a load of war reparations for World War One. Yeah, they did. And then all of a sudden the depression hit and they were like sort of like, oh shit, we need to call back. We need, we need to call back, call in our loans. And then obviously that caused a load of fucking strife and hyperinflation in Germany. And then Hitler was coming up at that time. Again, this is the second fucking episode. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Miss Hoover was with Hoover was fit. I love that. What was his name? Rooster. Yeah, Rooster. Tim, Tim Curry, wasn't it? That was Tim Curry, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. Anyway, um, didn't mean that she didn't try to fit in. <laughs> Sorry about that tangent. I love how we just went into, like, fucking the politics of, like... Of Annie. Of Annie. <laughs> in her teenage years, Suzanne moulded to her family's bourgeois lifestyle as best she could. She played tennis, dressed to the nines, and schmoozed with the other heirs of Arizona money. She tried to embody the ideal of their picturesque 1950s family. She learned to follow the path laid out for her, and in spite of roadblocks, it worked out for a while. Once an idiosyncratic reserve child, Suzanne remade herself into a preppy aristocrat, and it seems that it served her well into adulthood. Now, it's unclear what Suzanne was up to following high school, but what we do know is she managed to remain in Arizona's upper circles. It was likely while rubbing shoulders that she met and married a businessman of the same ilk. Now, we don't know what the husband's name was, but we do know that they settled in Scottsdale raising two children. It was a decidedly unruffled life for a girl who once shunned because of her psychic visions. However, it seemed normalcy was never on the cards for Suzanne. As the counterculture movements of the 1960s permeated the US, Suzanne felt wayward and wanted her soul drawn back towards that. Now, it's possible that in her adolescence, she repressed the shame that she once felt about her voices and visions, but when something triggered this internal tension, Suzanne realised that she was living a lie once again. She rebelled against her conservative life and embraced free love, political revolution and drugs to her husband's disapproval. Susan smoked marijuana frequently and took psychedelics to escape her boring home life. As far as we can tell, it was around this time that Suzanne first felt a pull towards religion. Ooh. Now, before we explore her religious journey, it's important to note that her practices and beliefs do not accurately accurately represent the teachings and texts she drew from her story, which exemplifies the dangers of exploiting and radicalising any religion for power. Just sort of clearing that up there. 
and also don't follow religion. During her surface level studies, the religious stories Suzanne loved most were full of eccentric characters whose odd spiritual talents elevated them to positions of control. Like Suzanne, these prophets and apostles often experienced visions and messages about the future. Thus, it was in religion that Suzanne, that Suzanne at last discovered an explanation for her powers. She trusted that she was a prophet of God and found a true sense of belonging. But at the same time, she felt that her purpose wasn't to follow a religious path. Um, she wanted to blaze a trail all on her own. She wanted to lead after early years spent watching her country at war. So, can you, anyone, can I just say I'm a prophet to God? And then that's it. Which God? Any. There's over 3,000 of them, many of them. I'm just like a prophet to all of them. I'd be a prophet of Anubis. I'm a prophet of um, that one with the goat. Which one with the goat? That one. That's a lot. The, the, the an Egyptian one with a goat. Any. I'm not. I'm not fussy. A moon. He'll do. One of them. Place of Ailey does. A moon. David and Moo. There you go. Suzanne knew the best way to That's lead was a to music to my ears. ears. Was polarized good and bad re- reading about religious wars of the past. Suzanne was captivated by the idea of future conflicts that would change the world. Furthermore, she was intrigued by Islam's history of spiritual warfare, exploring the Quran. Now, she was particularly fascinated with angel with angels sent as God's messengers of the apocalypse. Fixated on the idea of a coming final battle and the subsequent day of judgment. Suzanne obsessively pored over apocalyptic religious texts, bending them to her own self-interested interpretations. Let's be honest. Right. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, like, story-wise. Oh, yeah. But, Revelation is fucking mint. Big Big Revelation is best. fucking mint. Because it goes from, like, low-key stuff. Like, you know. It's the Empire Strikes Back of Bible books, Mm. isn't it? Mm. It's like, oh, here we go. War of Babylon. Fucking dragons, like men-headed locusts. Fucking dead rising from the grave Graves. and shit. Yeah. Fucking metal. Yeah, so it was, she came to believe, her mission to bring about this war and to root out the world's evildoers as such. Suzanne's followers to join her on, were to follow her on her spiritual journey. More than that, she wanted warriors of God to aid her in an imminent fight against the forces of evil. The further Suzanne sank into a religious immersion the more her loved ones worried about them. She was growing more and more unhinged. She ignored their concerns and remained hell-bent on making them all believers like her. However, her husband didn't follow his wife's new faith. Eventually, her behaviour and beliefs reached intolerable levels and he divorced her. Following their separation, Suzanne's supposed psychic powers increased. That's funny, that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the long-ignored visions and voices felt more powerful than ever before. With each recurring episode, Suzanne now's teenage children feared she would suffer a mental breakdown. Meanwhile, Suzanne herself worried that instead of the angelic warrior she once imagined herself to be, she was actually a witch possessed by a devil. As the fears of possession grew, Suzanne's identity splintered. She came to believe that a hole had been drilled into her skull, a sign of demonic activity. All of a sudden, she was sure she felt the devil slithering around inside her mind. Because that's what, like, devils do, isn't it? With their black and decker. I was reading a book, um, Hostage to the Devil, by Father Malachi or something. Um, It's all about, like, possession and stuff and things. And one of the cases in it, it gave, it gives the real, the real, real good example of how it feels like when they say like the possession is taking hold and the demon is trying to take hold. It was this priest who um, failed an exorcism and he wrote diaries and it's got all the diaries in about it of him being possessed. And he said like he could feel like the the demon just like giving himself self-doubt and saying like, you know, if you've done this, you know, this can't be real. And from this, you know, because this priest believed in evolution and all this stuff. And it was that, and it was basically an inner turmoil. It puts you in the situation, and you feel all this stress that he was under. And then, like, he didn't give into it, and then exercised. 
a demon. But um, yeah, go check that book out. Do you know? Do you know what the three true signs of demonic possession are? Head spinning, crucifix masturbating, and split pea soup. (laughs) No. Um, So number one is so number one. So if any of you guys are, um, if you think you're possessed, Leslie's going to see no. Yeah. So number one is being able to speak a language without learning it or like speaking in tongues. So like... I can't remember learning English. I just sort of spoke it. Well, you do, like, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like something you've culturally like sort of grown up with or actively learned. Like, it's just like one day you could wake up and suddenly you're you're speaking like... um, like Russian or Latin or I can, something I can speak, like. I can speak any language except for Greek. <clears throat> Come, on, give me a language. But yeah. give me a language. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Scottish Gaelic. All Greek to me, mate. Ah. <laughs> so that's sorry. That's number one. So that's number one. So like, say you can, you know, you can just, you're just suddenly able to like speak a language or a, another one is like speaking in tongues. So okay, what's number two? Uh, number two is... Number two. <laughs> yeah. Number two is knowing things that you couldn't like possibly know without having context. So like... Right, right. Um, remember when... Um it come out that John, before it come out that John Leslie had been um, battering women, mm-hmm. and it was a, there was a rumor that it was a, t- a TV personality had been battering women and sexually abusing them. I said, "I hope it's John Leslie," and then it was. Okay, that's that's impressive. So this is so we've got that's two, two two out of three. So, like, knowing stuff. So, like, say... say no, no, we get it. We get it. Yeah. Stuff. What's the third? So, I want to know if I'm possessed. So, the third is um, impressive physical feats. So, being able to lift things, like, many times you fucking... Many times your weight. Oh. So, like... And apparently for it to be properly investigated by what? the Church of England calls deliverance ministers, they generally have to be showing all three of these signs and then that's when they take things seriously. Because otherwise it could just be fakery or mental health problems. So say they walk into a, so say they walk into a house where there's a, an eight year old woman speaking Latin is able to tell you what you had for breakfast. And is swinging a fucking sofa round her head, then she's probably possessed. Or on crack. Or on crack. So I'm not possessed. So yeah, apparently there are three signs of demonic possession. Interesting. Um, yeah, so by this stage, it was clear that Suzanne's behaviour wasn't just religious fervour, but a worsening psychosis. Her children convinced her to see a psychiatrist, and she finally relented. According to the author, Richard Reynolds, um, of the awesome book on this, go and get it. It's awesome. Um, Suzanne was prescribed medication and returned for regular appointments with her doctor. But when her symptoms did not improve, she likely suspected the psychiatrist was trying to rob her of both her psychic abilities and religious conviction. We don't want that. No. Having finally found a sense of power through her faith, she was certain the doctors were out to sabotage her. The mindset eventually alienated Suzanne's children. Though they wanted to help their mother, they were at their wit's ends. They went to live with their father and Suzanne never saw them again. Now, she was truly alone for the first time. She spent her time and inheritance attending parties, getting high and bringing strangers home. But none of the people she met seemed interested in her religious ramblings. As Suzanne's ideas evolved, she remained convinced that she needed true believers to follow her in her footsteps. Without an army of warriors, she didn't stand a chance against the impending darkness, and she was sure that time was running out. Most of her life, Susan Barnes was plagued by the voices of visions, but she was convinced she was on a mission from God. Her most important follower was James Carson. Now, since James became known as Michael, we're going to call him Michael now, okay? 
So for generations, Michael's family enjoyed a violent reputation. He was born in the Wild West, descended on his father's side from gunslingers and sheriffs who weren't afraid to shoot a man if they felt they needed to. I mean, that must have been a good life, wouldn't it? She was like, what did you shoot for? I needed to. Felt it. Just felt it. Felt right. Yeah. But from the start, it seemed that Destiny had different plans for Michael. His father booked family tradition and chose the private sector over law enforcement with an oil company executive for his father. It's likely that Michael's upbringing was similar in comfort to Suzanne's. But while Suzanne grew up in the desert landscape of Arizona, Michael spent his childhood living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Consequently, his love of nature was influenced by Native American culture. Oh, nice. It's perhaps this influence that led Michael to believe in God and nature were one. And in the solitude of the woods near his home, he found, if not religion, but at least something divine. However, the sense of solace he found in nature was cut short. In childhood, he was diagnosed with a rare bone disorder called Perth's disease, which called the pelvis joint to soften. It made the young boy limp when he walked, which worried his parents. Michael's doctors um, prohibited all walking until the affected tissue had time to repair and hardened and he was suddenly cut off from nature. That really sucks. It does. Really feel for him, man. Yeah. Michael was distraught and overnight the enthusiastic outdoors kid became an isolated shut-in and during, be- and during a bed rest sentence it dragged on for three years he was trapped inside. Oh no, I really feel gutted, man. Like... I definitely kind of see what he says. Like, I'm in no way religious, but I do have, like, sort of spiritual proclivities. And I do think that, like, w- there is something kind of divine about being out in nature. and Oh, yeah. Just going out and having, like, a really nice walk and being out there. It's, it's really sort of liberating. And that's that fucking sucks. Poor guy. Poor guy. Sorry, I just want to... Just want to... Solidarity with the lad. Does turn into a bit of a prick. Well, that remains to be seen. But Michael passed much of his time by reading with little else to do. He sped through books of all genres and subject matters and quickly surpassed the typical reading level for his age, reading from a broad range of subjects. He found history, philosophy and politics of particular interest. However, reading about religion inspired him to reject his half-Jewish heritage and eventually all religions. Cut off from the natural wonders he once hinted at a godlike being, Michael came to see any religious ideas as foolish. Similarly, he was disheartened by the usual United States political system. So by the time he was allowed to walk again, the young team declared himself an atheist and a Marxist, as they all do. As if the the years-long separation from classmates wasn't enough, Michael's new radical views alienated him from just about everyone in his conservative town. So while most young people around him were focused on paddling around and going on dates, Michael gravitated towards hippie movements sprouting up in cities around the country. It seemed like the emerging counterculture movements accepted outsiders like him, and they would help him find a purpose. To that end, he embraced the anti-establishment resistance spreading through the country. In high school, he smoked pot and even started a chapter of the Students for a Democratic Society, hoping to inspire political defiance in his classmates' revolution against institutional power. I didn't think it'd work in Tulsa. Excited Michael. (laughs) Excited Mike. (laughs) I mean, he was excited. And Michael, what he learned in books about the world left him cynical. But now he saw purpose and meaning through the action. And he was willing to walk the walk. At the end of high school, he took to the streets in protest. In 1968, Michael travelled to San Francisco to join the flower power demonstration against the Vietnam War. Walking the streets with people who shared his ideas, he found some semblance of belonging he searched for. He was part of a movement for universal social change. His desire to bring about change didn't waver when the young radical went to college at University of Iowa, studying history and religion for his Chinese philosophy major. He was all notoriously outspoken in class, especially about the more to few opinions that he held. They knew how to do a march back then. And he did, didn't he? Believe. And a protest. Say what you want about the hippies, but, you know. They knew how to do a march. They knew how to- not, not like these days. Like, I, I went on a couple of marches last year, and, uh, want to know, want to know something? Want to know something, folks? Those marches I went on. Bullshit. Yeah, but last protest I went on was against um, the 
a second rap war. Mine was kill the bill. Yeah. This bloke called Bill. I don't like him. So they protested. Yeah. And I was like, who's Bill? And they were like, well, what we want to do is redispute funds from... from the- Essentially what it is, is um, the British government are trying to stop protests. So so it was that. So it was a good cause. But it got very much muddied with with other political things. And there was a point where two individuals got up. And I'm not going to lie. I thought they were going to start beatboxing. Over that would to be you. cool. Possibly approached the movement primarily as a way to define himself and connect with others rather than out of true support of any cause. In a 2017 study in the Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology, researchers found that young people were motivated to do activist work out of a desire for justice and a sense of group belonging. But sooner than he might have anticipated, Michael's fight came to an end after campaigning for Bobby Kennedy's presidency in 1968. And he was left reeling after he was assassinated, realising that political movements were growing increasingly violent and decidedly less hopeful. Michael lost faith in the cause. Once more, he was adrift, perhaps because he was disheartened, perhaps because he was a child of the 60s. He experimented with stronger drugs and for one particular trip on mescaline, proved it proved a life-altering hallucinogen. The mescaline caused Michael to imagine the sky and buildings pulsing around him. In his drug-induced haze, he staggered to a church, where he experienced some kind of religious vision. Now, I'm going to say, I don't go to church, but if I was fucking on mescaline, imagine going into a church, right, with all those fucking stained glass windows around it, all the things, it'd be fucking trippy as fuck. Yeah, man. I mean, I I was on mushrooms once, and um, I was walking down the street, and it was (laughs) raining, and it was night, and there was traffic lights and there was a curry house and it had a big pink neon sign and they were reflecting in the fucking rain on the road and it was amazing. Well, like this is the... And Don't do drugs, kids. And in a way, I mean, for one, they believe that like um, in the Temple of uh, Solomon... Oh, what did you say? Doom then? Temple of Doom. But like in the Temple of Solomon, there's like where they used to like burn all the incense and stuff. There's been archaeological, like, sort of discoveries that there's a good chance that they were using a powerful, like, a very potent form of hashish, like, within within the um, fucking, within the incense. But also just the way that, like, things, because you've got, like, the big circular, like, sort of windows, which act as, like, sort of mandalas, which, like, you can find instances of mandalas in, like, fucking... Like in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Christianity, in 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 Islam, like so that's going to have a powerful psychological effect, surely, especially if you're on. And don't forget the best mind, man, don't you? Nelson. Nelson. So there, on the steps of the church, he fell into <laughs> hysterics. The spiritual trip changed Michael, and the atheist set himself on the path to find a religious belonging, like a light switching on. Everything suddenly fell into place for him. Churches were everywhere, finally offering him a stable community he could belong to and cause, <laughs> and give him a cause that he could follow. Not only did Michael find God, he also found love. In between church sermons and college classes, he met fellow student Lynn, bonding over similar academic interests. Wasn't he half Jewish? Yeah. Why don't you just do Judaism? Like when he he didn't go to a synagogue while he was tripping his balls off. Because like they 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 got a pretty cool religion. What you got? Yeah, like, you know. But he's like uh, only half Jewish, and um, then he was like tripping balls. Went into a church. He was like, do you know what? This is for me. They wouldn't have been like fuck off, you Gentile, though, would they? Surely no, he would have been. No, I think he was no. He would have been fine. Anyway. The pair began dating in their sophomore year and they decided to get married and for a while everything was just peachy for Michael. They felt like they could the college sweethearts who'd found their happily ever afters. Oh. <laughs> no. 
No. You only committed one hate crime. For a few years, the couple seemed destined for a life of domestic bliss. Following their graduation in the early 1970s, Michael and Lynn moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where Lynn found work as a teacher, and they welcomed a baby girl named Jen. Michael assumed the duties of a full-time dad. Aww. But not long after the birth, Lynn discovered a sign of Michael she hadn't seen before. He fell into depression and was easily irritated. At times he got angry enough that he hit her. Still, despite the sometimes violent disagreements, the marriage lasted a few more years. It seemed that neither Michael nor Lynn wanted to give up on their relationship. We don't know enough about Lynn to speculate as, um, as to her reasons, but based on Michael's history, it seems likely he didn't want to be left alone. Around this time, Michael's drug use increased, perhaps as a coping mechanism for feelings of isolation. But he wasn't just using it, he was also selling marijuana on the side. As any good dad does, apparently. Not me. As a good dad, you're okay. Michael's drug... <laughs> <laughs> Michael's drug habits and sad hustle only <laughs> exacerbated... They were edibles. Nobody would know. <laughs> they look like fucking nerds. Neon he's, nerds. He's essentially Kirk Van Houten. Aren't you? I get to sleep in a race car, Jan. Well done. I get to sleep next to my wife who loves me. Hey. Simpsons reference number one. Lezzie, this should be a drinking game every time. Lezzie's, Lezzie's new um, album's coming out. Can I borrow a feeling? <laughs> they're they're, they're going to have a drinking game of everyone has to drink when you drink and people are going to die. It's, um, it's not a problem. I know people question that. It's not a problem. It's just that generally we record on weekends. And I'd get hammered on a weekend. We generally don't record on weekends. Every given day of the week, when the sun gets past a certain... Drink your feelings. I don't need to go to A and A and D. Just, just, just drink your feelings away. Okay. 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 So yeah, uh, Michael couldn't hold down a job either, so it, exas- it frustrated Lynn. And it seemed more, he seemed more interested in getting high than finding work. And they were at an impasse and tension brew between Michael and Lynn. He likely felt stifled while she was probably fed up with friction. It's, she was probably just fed up with him being a pothead and, and not getting depre- a job. Because that's not going to help, is it? Like, no. if, if you're depressed and like, because marijuana is a uh, depressant, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so it was alcohol, plus. So it was only a matter well, of time I can give up whenever I want. No, you can't. It was only a matter of time before something gave out. One day in 1977, a disagreement turned violent and Michael started beating her. Then he hit her so hard that she dropped the glass she was holding and it shattered all over the kitchen floor while Michael... um... (laughs) Sorry, Les, I I just love how you argue that you haven't got an alcohol problem all the time. It's like the lady does protest too much. She dropped the glass. Yeah, I know. She was getting battered, though. Yeah, but the ba- um, baby Jen was crawling across the floor as she did it, and she cut herself on the shattered glass. Oh, shit. The daughter's injury was the last straw for Lynn. It likely helped to see that Michael's behaviour would only get worse, further endangering Jen. That night, Lynn left, taking Jen with her. A short while later, she filed for divorce. Now, with his family gone, 26-year-old Michael had little left in his life. Even his excitement for religion waned. He'd spent years searching for meaning and hadn't found true fulfilment anywhere. What he needed was someone to show him the way to ignite the spark within him. If only he could find it. Despondent, he fell into a routine of partying too hard and taking too many drugs. While unmoored, Michael came to terms with his stalled life. He was recently divorced and Suzanne Barnes was on her journey of her own. Now, the 36-year-old still followed, who was still searching for her followers, who would willingly fight against the encroaching darkness. Around this time, Michael and Suzanne were part of the same Scottsdale party scene. Michael lightly supplied the drugs, while Suzanne was a notorious guest and occasional host. A oh, notorious guest? Yeah, because they were like, it's this weird woman who's trying to recruit us all to fight the darkness. Go on, tell, tell us our fortune. That's not what I do. On Thanksgiving night 1977, the two finally noticed each other. For the first time that night, Susan was high on acid. For, it was high on acid, and it was her first time. But weird, isn't it? You'd think someone like her would do acid all the time. I mean, 
I would. And when she locked eyes with Michael, she felt the whole body tingle. She felt certain that this man, whoever he was, was selected for her by Ali. Surely that would be the acid. No, it's her uh, psychic powers. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Duh, Les. Pardon me all to hell. So Suzanne strode across the room and told him that Ali had named him Michael. After the Archangel instantly besotted them, the newly renamed Michael didn't hesitate when Suzanne suggested they party at her house. Now remember, his name wasn't Michael before this. She just walked over and said, Alice called you Michael after the Angel, and he's like, okay. But he's he's not called Michael in the Quran. Yeah, but she, she's read loads of stuff, Les. I think he might be called Mickey Al or something like that. Oh no, that's wrong. Quite sure he's not called Michael don't in the matter, Quran. Don't matter. Don't matter. He's the badass angel, though. Yeah. Hey. Michael is fucking cool. And hey, back in her unkempt living room, Laz, Suzanne put on a Grateful Dead record and danced for Michael in a way that felt mystical to them both. To be fair, Grateful Dead. Mm. Nice. As she swayed sensuously near him, Suzanne whispered that she had wandered the astral plane for thousands of years, waiting for her soulmate. Look how I'm fucking in. So now she told Michael she'd found him. Suzanne and Michael spent that night together and every night following their whirlwind romance. And it was fueled by hallucinogenic drugs and the emergence of religious certainty. However, when Michael brought up the merits of Christianity, she laughed him off. <laughs> he was like, well, you know what? I think Jesus was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Christians were hypocrites who followed untrustworthy doctrine, Les. She explained that the God who brought them together was Ali and no other deity mattered. He's the same fucking God. Yeah, but Michael just went, yeah, okay, whatever. He's like, there's, there's big... They're not, well, fuck. Les, she's dancing sensuously to the Grateful Dead for him. He's going, you you say anything to women. I'd be fucking, yeah, to be honest, I'd be plunging right there. Yeah, so after years of searching, the stars... Be like, hush now. Shh, shh, shh. Dance for me, Susan. Dance for me. Come to the come to the sofa. Boom! You're pregnant. After years of searching, the stars felt a line for both Michael and Suzanne. He had a cause to believe in and a strong leader to show him the way. Suzanne had a pliable acolyte to join her army of warriors. Warriors, plural, is one. Not him. Together they would fight. But she's now, also a warrior. Yeah, I, I think she's more of a like leader. A, a leader. She's like, yeah, go over there. The best leaders lead from the front. I mean, they're the dead ones. Yeah, usually. Yeah, usually. now all they needed was a con- common enemy. Coming up, Michael and Susan prepared to strike down the forces of darkness. But first, an ad break. <laughs> Welcome back. So, it's November 1977 now, Les. 26-year-old Michael Carson met 36-year-old Suzanne Barnes at a drug fuel party and they were instantly drawn to one another. Beautiful, okay? is it? They moved in together and Michael fell in line with Susan's religious ramblings about a coming holy war with Michael by her side. <laughs> Fucking simp. Now, she believed that her psychic visions, they were growing stronger every every day and the voices that were once diagnosed as a symptom of psychosis now took on the sound of authority of something wholly divine. Clearly, she was like Jean Grey, and this was the Phoenix Force. Was Michael Cyclops? Yeah. Yeah. So, still, Suzanne feared her powers were corrupted by evil, and she herself was a witch under Satan's spell. But Michael, the devoted follower, assured her that she was, she was a yogi, someone blessed by God with second sight, happy to believe she was even more blessed. A yogi? They're really, um, they're really, really da- cherry picking from all the religions yeah. here. I mean, what I like is she's like, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm an evil witch and Satan's inside me and I can feel him rhythm around. No, you're not. You're just a yogi with second sight. And she's like, oh, okay. Cool. Where does the person called Bear come into this? <laughs> Smarter than the average bear. I'll shut the fuck up. Yeah, please do. So it was clear that the two offered each other exactly what they wanted. From a partner with an eager pupil to learn about a religion, Suzanne felt validated. Her lifelong visions were divine, and Michael felt sure that his quest for a belonging led him directly to Suzanne. A strong believer who gave him a purpose, he would follow her wherever she led him. So in the summer of 1978, the pair sold all of their belongings and hopped on a plane to Europe. 
Europe. Europe. In the Grand Tour, were they? Yeah. It was a fulfilment of a prophecy from Allah, she told him, and she hoped it would yield marriage, a child, and religious clarity. So soon after they arrived in London on the eve of the summer solstice, Michael and Suzanne were officially, were, sorry, unofficially married in their hotel room with a ritual that they designed following the ceremony. So, they literally went into a hotel room and were like, okay, let's In do London. It's, it's not really Europe. Yeah, it's like, well, okay, you hold this donut and I'll hold this pepper pot. And then we'll sprinkle the pepper on the donut, and that's like, and they just made shit. I mean, they were there on the solstice. They could have fucked off to Stonehenge, mm. at least. I mean, the people at Stonehenge on the solstice do something similar, just fold it all in. There you go, then. But during the ceremony, they changed their surname <clears throat> to Bear in honour of Michael's childhood. So she was a fucking yogi bear. And love of the animal. I didn't want ruining it for you. <laughs> fuck, fuck yes. So she, let me, let, let me just get this straight. Let's rewind. Let's rewind. Let's so rewind. Michael said she was a yogi. Yogi. And her surname is now Bear. No, say it to me again. Say it to me again. She was a yogi. And her surname was Bear. So Michael said that she was a yogi. And they changed the surname to Bear. That's lit. Right. You haven't made a joke there, Les. What you've done is repeat back to me what I've told you twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. That, yes. Yes, I was right, Les, in what I said. Okay, okay. You do you. You just Boo, you. boo. Oh. <laughs> that was a cackle. Anybody new coming into this is going to be like, this is like a fucking fever dream. 10,000 subs. We must be doing something right. <laughs> Don't know what, but we are. So, um, yeah, they changed the surname to Bear in honour of Michael's childhood and love of the animal. By the time they left London for a visit to Stonehenge, Suzanne was pregnant. Wait, we've got to do it. Stonehenge, where the demons dwell, and the banshees live, and they do live well. Go do the rest. Final oh. tap for you. So, despite the fruition of two of her three goals for the trip, Suzanne felt bogged down by her fears of evil. She was anxious about the presence of the so-called witches who seemed to be everywhere they went. Well, they do. Yeah, In Stonehenge, like I said. Where, like uh, Where the demons dwell. Dwell. Where the banshees live. And they do live well. Where a man's a man. <laughs> After a lifetime of believing she was psychic, Suzanne felt confident in her ability to sense witchcraft and behaviour that smacked of the Middle Ages. She saw evil sorcery at every turn. At any setback, she insisted that witchcraft was to blame. Additionally, anyone who inconvenienced or offended Suzanne was labelled a witch. Witch. Now, it's not just her. I'm thinking Texas. Alabama, that general region. It's like something's gone wrong. I blame damn witches. They also did that in. There was a boot burning the other day, you know. Where? Um, I think it was in Arkansas. I, I could be wrong. But, um, That's brought, a weird They bought that... Twilight books and Harry Potter <clears throat> books. I don't blame them. No, don't. Um, but that's, I mean, the very the very name Arkansas in itself is fucking witchcraft. I, because... um, I was talking to someone the other day who was talking to one of their friends who'd who'd gone through about almost 30 years of their life, thinking that Arkansas was called Arkansas. Arkansas, yeah. It does. You can see where they're coming from, though. It does look like it says uh, Arkansas. Yeah, but that's just stupid. It is. I mean, when you realise, but it does, it's like Arkansas. Arkansas, don't know why I'm talking a Yorkshire accent, because I'm in America, but Arkansas. Right, stop that. Ah, Kansas. So, to Suzanne, anyone on crowded streets and homeless populations in Holland, France and Spain were signs of spreading evil around the globe. Witchcraft, and by extension, the devil was to blame for the growing shadow, and she had to do something about it. The growing shadow. But their refreshed zeal for eradicating the evil was disrupted by personal tragedy. While on a post-European jaunt to Israel, Susan miscarried. F's in the chat for Susan. F's. Susan was devastated by the loss of the child. El, um, Alia. Yeah, no, Alia. 
a liar. I was going to say, about to say that. So that's like, what that name says. I thought it was like Alia, like from fucking Queen of the Damned. So, why are you laughing? Because I've just been saying idiots saying Arkansas, and you're like, I can see where it comes from. Oh, it's Alia. I thought it was Alia, like, like from who played the Queen of the Damned. That was Alia. Alia, okay, so. Yeah, that was a spot, definitely. <laughs> uh... think Just sit there, have a drink, and just think about your life choices. Will you? So yeah, they called the, ba- the baby that, got, uh, that she miscarried a liar, and they promised um, they were looking around for someone to blame for it because they were saying it's not our fault. It didn't take long for her to land on witches for it, as you can imagine. Now, the pregnancy had been hexed in Europe, and for that, all witches would burn, according to Susan. Driven into action, the newlyweds returned to the United States. Not only did they believe they were following the rules of Islam, they also were they self-proclaimed machines or hash-smoking assassins for Allah. <laughs> That's, That's actually where the word assassin comes from. No, though, no I just love that. Self-proclaimed machines... Or hash smoking, hash smoking assassins for Ali. You can fucking imagine it. It's like, when we were supposed to kill somebody today? Oh, forgot all about it. I'm quite sure that's where it comes from. And you just get a knife and you just go to someone. Dude. What? <laughs> fucking killed you, dude. I think it is because of the practice of smoking hashish. So that's where it's like the root term of the word assassin. Like they, they would have been called the assassin. Stop making this educational, will you? Just try. No one cares. No one cares about history, Les. It was in the past. Who gives a shit? If history was so good, why aren't it here now? There you go. Just, 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 let's back. No, let's not backtrack on that. Why is it not here now? No. Because we're not dealing with the effects of history. Are we? In any way. Just do me a favour. Come here. Because when you're over there, that camera can't see you. And you keep doing this, look. It's because I'm terrified. Of the just come here. I'll steal my soul, Jan, like the witches. Stay here. Anyway, Suzanne told Michael they were modern day witch hunters. However, Suzanne was adamant that it wouldn't just be an empty title. So she had to answer Alice's call to exterminate the world's evil because it was clear to her that no one else would. I mean, someone's, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it for Alice, haven't they? Yeah, it's like the attack of the killer tomorrow. Yeah. Um, no, that didn't have Kevin Bacon in. Kevin Bacon was in Sizzle Beach, USA. No, that was Kevin Costner. What was Kevin? Tremors. No, Kevin Costner was in Attack of the Killer Tomatoes as well. Also in Sizzle Beach, USA, I think. Anyway, convinced Michael that, um, she convinced Michael that their resolve had to be stronger. Now more than ever, it was important to even um, evangelize and enlist help in their impending war because the witches would surely fight back as all witches do. So, with her mission in mind, the couple travelled along the northwest coast of California. They sold drugs and lived a nomadic lifestyle, getting the lay of the land. Once they'd seen the cities and where things were most dire, they decided on which one to strike first. In 1980, they moved to San Francisco. Sure, why not? It's going to be a fertile hunting ground for a minute. I mean, that's... San such, Francisco. San Francisco is where... Hippies were, Manson, all that shit. You know what I mean? So um, their successful journey was a sign from Ali that they'd chosen the right city in the right infamous Hyde Ashbury district. See? Not just a pretty face. Michael and Suzanne scowled at the diverse population and the prevalence of sin based on their be- twisty beliefs. Sex workers, beggars and hippies were abhorrent, but just a symptom of a bigger problem eager to get off the streets. Witches. The pair made their way to a party hosted by Suzanne's acquaintances, but inside the building, Suzanne claimed to feel overwhelming nausea and fear when they opened the door to the party. The reason was clear. Everyone was a witch. Witches. This is like fucking that Monty Python sketch, isn't it? It's like, she's, she's a witch. 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 She turned me, me into, into a newt. Newt. I got, I got better. better. <laughs> who are you in, who is so learned in the ways of science? So, you know, if a witch weighs the same as a duck, she's a witch. It's true. It's true. Because, you know, what floats? A duck. Duck. 
A duck floats. Yeah, little tiny pebbles. So uh, as the music pulls and the butt dissuades, Suzanne looked past the crowd to a lone <laughs> woman in the black dress and an orange mohawk. Suzanne was enchanted by 22-year-old Karen Barnes with her punk rock look and beguiling dancing. And when Suzanne told the aspiring actress about her psychic gifts, Karen gushed that she was clairvoyant as well. Michael too felt drawn to Karen. She had an aura about her that bewitched him like Suzanne. He wanted to get to know her better. He just likes, it's a bit like you, he just likes girls that are a bit mental. Eddie Gilk was like, well, yeah, you know, I, I like folklore and, you know, I like stabbing stones because they make me angry. You're like, yeah. Stones? Just anything. That's what you went for. I don't know what. The hardest of things. Yeah, because, you know, these women you date are fucking crazy. Not all crazy. Some are just malignant. Some are just fucking crazy. Some of them take you on marches and... Uh, Some of them befriend the other ones that you're dating. Bit s- weird. S- yeah. And this then was... go hang out with them. You're going to get... I've told you, you were going to be murdered by one of these people. It's going to happen. You've resigned yourself to it now, aren't you? You're going to be killed by a woman. I don't... Yeah, it's probably going to happen. And you know what, yeah? Do you know what... Um, I deserve it. You do. But before you do that... Can you sign a thing saying that I've got the rights to it? I've got to find a co-host then. If you do want to be a co-host when Les has been murdered, please drop me a line and I'll get interviews going. It's a tough act to follow. You just literally sit here and drink and make me a cup of tea every now and again. It has to be, he likes it specific. He likes it very specific. I do. Two sugars, milk, really strong. Yeah. Use two tea bags, please. Anyway. And uh, what? Well, and in his big mug, I will leave the big mug. He will pass that on to you in an important ceremony. I would. It's, no. it's not that impress. That I've got that exact same mug at home. I'm not trying to impress you. I just want you to know that you get the big mug. Thank you. When you're here, because I care. Thank you. Apart from anything else, um, Karen was obedient and seemed receptive to new experiences. Shortly after they met, Karen invited Michael and Suzanne to come and live with her. They were overjoyed to move into Karen's basement apartment. Now they had a base from which they could carry out their plans to eradicate San Francisco's witches under the same roof. Suzanne set about teaching Karen more about the form of Islam that she and Michael practiced, i.e. it's not really Islam, they just made it up. The young woman was particularly intrigued by the idea of San Francisco's witches and Susanna Michael's roles as machines wanting to contribute. She dedicated to learning the rituals Suzanne described. For a while, things were peaceful in the household, but as the weeks wore on, Suzanne felt a growing resentment towards Karen. She couldn't work out why. I've got an inkling. I've got an inkling. So, November 1980, on the night of Reagan's election... Both Suzanne and Michael claimed to feel a great evil enveloped the country. Panicked, Michael shared with Karen their theory that Reagan was the devil, but she didn't seem surprised. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm on balance. I don't think anyone was surprised if she come up and said Ronald Reagan was Satan. I mean, we've 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 very much gone into our. Uh, I mean, I've told you this. His effects on like um, criminal law and things like that. In- we have, and also. His wife sucked dick like a demon. He was definitely hammering Ma- Margaret Thatcher. Fucking Nancy Reagan. He was hammering Margaret Thatcher, though. That special relationship. I don't, I don't give a fuck. I, I, I mean, if I had a time travel machine now, you know, people go back and go, oh, give me my grandparents and, oh, I'd go kill baby Hitler. I'd fucking MGM lot. You know, she was Meet really... Nancy Reagan. You know, she actually come out in defence, Thatcher, of, um, what's his name, the Chilean dictator? Pinochet. Pinochet. Yes, called Margaret Thatcher was an evil fucking cunt, and I'm glad she's burning in hell. You know, I like swimming. Do you know what my favourite stroke was? Margaret Thatcher's. <laughs> fucking bitch. Really don't like the Conservatives. I don't do. like Margaret Thatcher, the fucking slag. She was fucking hate Thatcher. Who was that one who was definitely having a good a good old nosh on um, John Major? Oh. She was on fucking uh, Gordon Ramsay's... Edwina uh, Curry. Edwina Curry, that's the one. Band eggs. 
There you she go. banned eggs. Yeah, he's too young, remember? Don't worry. Anyway. You can't tell me that after I want more. So, in... F- well, she didn't ban... No matter. Anyway, so, in fact, according to the <laughs> to the book Cry for War, which is the story of theirs, go and get that book. It's fucking awesome. Michael Cannon said she was already aware that Reagan was the beast. She counted on the president-elect's names. Really? Ronald Wilson Reagan each contained six letters. Six, six, six. Now, far from being impressed by her insights, Suzanne felt irritated by Cannon's growing smugness and confidence. It was maddening to have such a free-thinking student. But that wasn't the only thing that annoyed Susan lately. Probably witches. So, she noticed Cannon and Michael flirting as per their version of the Islamic faith. Michael was free to take more than one wife, and it was Suzanne's duty to support him. But in her heart, Suzanne knew she could never let Michael marry another woman. And he was Suzanne's soulmate. A guardian angel, and Cannon could not be allowed to take him away from it. She's just a bit jealous, really, isn't she? Yeah. So, coincidentally, around this time, Suzanne felt growing suspicions that Karen was actually a witch. Funny that, isn't it? Yeah, funny. <laughs> yeah. Was it the Mohawk? <laughs> no, I think it's because, like, you know, she's banging Michael. Um, information that she shared with Michael. Not only was Karen a witch, but Suzanne believes she's the most powerful witch in San Francisco. Suzanne claims that since moving in with Karen, her powers and body were weaker. <laughs> Coincidence. <laughs> the only explanation was a witch in the house, obviously. Of course it is. It was a test, she announced, of their faith and their relationship. Karen must die and Michael must be the one to do it. So in February 1981, when I was born, just after, the, after Karen's 23rd birthday, the couple confronted her about the presence of a witch in the house. That you know this house that you've let us move into? Yeah. Yeah. You're a witch. Karen denied the accusations, of course she did. But Suzanne wasn't convinced that she wouldn't be. You know, as the arguments spilled into the kitchen, she screamed at Michael urging him to kill the witch. Can I just say Kill the witch Kill the, the witch. fucking pitchfork oh. in a torch <laughs> Kill the witch like, Where did you get them from? Dressed as a fucking Puritan. Yeah. <laughs> So, Michael picked up a frying pan and in the great style of bottom, hit Karen over the head and she fell to the floor. He seized the knife and then stabbed her over and over. Not as funny. Satisfied, Susan cackled as Michael bludgeoned Karen again and again with the pan. Dunk, 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 dunk. <laughs> This shouldn't be as comical as it, it shouldn't be, is, but, but it is. I'm just, are you just thinking of bottom? Yeah. Yeah? Literally <laughs> just thinking of bottom. <laughs> anyway, with each strike, Suzanne claimed she felt strength returning to her body. While Susan drew strength, Michael panicked over the murder they just committed. Are you, are you back? Yeah. Thank Sorry. You. But Suzanne assured him they were fulfilling an important prophecy to kill the most dangerous witch in the city. Their task in San Francisco was complete. She said they'd done exactly what they come to do. Now we've got to move on. Because, you know, we've just killed this witch. Better run, haven't we? They left the city on foot, in thumbing rides north. According to Suzanne, Allah had much work left for them to do. Jesus Christ. Now they struck the first blow against the witches, the real hunt could begin. Baptised in blood, the star-crossed assassins set out to rid the world of witches forever. In reality, Karen's murder was motivated by 39-year-old Susan's jealousy... But eager to be rid of the flirtatious 23-year-old, Suzanne (laughs) told Michael it was their duty to kill her. You know, they're all warriors of God, after all, aren't they? Warriors of Allah. So just in case you didn't get that, she wasn't really a witch. She was just jealous. Bonk! Oh, God. Eventually, they made their way to Southern Oregon. Did they not try and dispose of the body? Like, they fucking left her there. It's a witch, isn't it? Its legs will curl up. And leave the ruby slippers. Could have at least fucking thrown water on her. Melted her away. Do witches melt after you've killed them? If you throw water on them, or is it just like... I don't know. In The Wizard of Oz, they do. I 
have to move out. Anyway, um, but with no money and few job prospects, they ventured into the woods hoping to find shelter after wandering aimlessly for a while. They were delighted to find a vacant cabin um, and this decrepit filthy shack was a holy home, blessed by God and surrounded by nature. They had everything they needed, their healthy stash of drugs and each other. That's what you need in life, isn't it? A healthy stash of drugs and each other. Nature. It was peaceful there for a while, but before long, Michael grew anxious about the police tracking them down for the first time. It seems Michael questioned whether their half-baked religious quest to rid the world of witches was worth going to prison for. <laughs> I mean, Susan just dismissed his trepidation, insisting that law would gu- that law would guide them through whatever. Sorry, Ali would guide them past the law and guide them through whatever they wanted to go through. Her visions were stronger now because she'd killed that witch, and for a good reason. Not only was she surrounded by the glory of God's creation, she was also ingesting a decent amount of marijuana and hallucinogenic drugs. The stronger vision cemented Susan's conviction. Their cause was righteous in her mind. Susan and Michael were bona fide witch hunters tasked with starting a world-ending holy war, though it was clear that they could accomplish neither goal languishing in the woods of Oregon. I mean, you're not going to fight a holy war in Oregon. No, no. Before they could go anywhere, they needed to decide on a plan. They wouldn't spot apocalypse by killing one or two lone witches. Now, usually it was Susan who pointed out the world's evils to Michael, one of her God-given gifts, she insisted, was the ability to sense witches. But after four years together, Michael picked up some tricks of his own and zeroed in on their next target. I love how he's picked up these tricks up. Do you know what? Oh, no. okay. I've got these psychic powers now. He's just like, don't like it. She's a fucking witch. This is like this is like the fucking um, Salem witch tales all over again, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, what could be go wrong with that? Nothing. Here's my picture of a Salem witch trials for you. So, having read the book of Revelation, Marco was convinced that their ultimate enemy was the devil, the master of witches. He also knew the devil's earthly symbol was 666, and he'd use that knowledge to deduce that the newly elected president, Ronald Reagan, was the devil walking among them. So, Reagan had to die, Marco declared, and it was his destiny to take him down further. They've gone ambitious, haven't they? I mean, he's gone from that, you know, the hot punk girl to Ronald Reagan. I mean... I don't think you're the only person who thought Ronald Reagan was the devil and needed to be killed. No. <laughs> so displaying an uncanny gift for... for <laughs> displaying her uncanny gift for seeing things in the future, she agreed and supported him in his in his endeavours. It was foretold, but it seems that Susan's direct line to God was fuzzy because Michael wasn't destined to assassinate President Reagan. No. No. He wasn't the only one who had the idea, though. In the March of 1981, when Michael saw that another man, John Hinckley Jr., failed in his attempt to kill the president, he was outraged. I mean, he's like, motherfucker! <laughs> he's like, if I do it now, security's going to be tighter, they're going to think I'm a copycat. But while her husband stewed over the botched attempt on president's life, Suzanne had other things on her mind. After a month in the woods, they were out of money, food, wheat, and also drugs. As ever, it was Michael's duty to solve Suzanne. Wheat? Wheat, yeah. But wheat. That's random, isn't it? Well, she needed wheat, but they're out of drugs, so that's her main problem. But if you wheat, wheat, they can make bread and shit, can't they? You need other things. Yeah, but they're going to... They're out of wheat. It's like, we've got to move on, we're out of wheat. Yeah. I mean, so he decided that Los Angeles would be the best place for him to go. That he could gather supplies and would sustain them for the coming conflict. At first, Suzanne dismissed the plan, not wanting to let Michael go out of her sight, but then she was forced to admit that there wasn't another logical solution. But as he packed his bag for a journey, Michael was worried over the distinct lack of food. As ever, Suzanne had the, had an answer courtesy of her visions. She explained, it. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say here, it's like, oh, I'm worried, we've got no food. So I'm going, I'm having a vision. We buy some. It's not really a psychic vision, is it? There's an IHOP. Yeah. Five miles away. So she decided that she would go on a great fast, 
while Mark was away, it would be a holy experience. So bolstered by Suzanne's faith, he set out intending to return with food and a renewed vigour for his duty. For his duty. Though he hitched rides and made it to Los Angeles in May of 1981 and made a beeline for Venice Beach, which was known for its hippie population and abundance of drugs. Though he set out for LA with a clear goal of bringing back supplies to Suzanne, Michael got sidetracked without his guidance. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went for food, but I kind of... You just bought drugs, didn't you? No, 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 Blaz. Instead of getting drugs and food, he stole paper and markers to make signs alerting the world to the evils of Ronald Reagan, wanting, the pres- wanting to present one clear, unified message. He had his eyes on the prize. He did. He's still like, I fucking hate Reagan. So, I, I know my wife, my it's, wife, it's, is at home on a fast. She needs drugs and food, but I'm going to steal these marker pens. And this bit of cardboard, I'm going to make a sign saying Reagan is the devil. Then everyone's going to pay attention to me. Doesn't matter there's 30 other people holding them around here. And, and maybe we'll get food. I'm speculating to accumulate. So, Michael also defaced Venice Beach public restrooms with phrases like Revolution Now, Death to Reagan, and Alu Akbar, which is Arabic for God is the Greatest. <laughs> These fucking people. He then hung the signs in areas popular with tourists, perhaps hoping they would spread the message around the world while slapping posters up around Venice. Michael felt inspiration to strike, and he gathered more scraps of paper to keep track of his thoughts. I like to think that like he may be, be standing there watching these people like pass by and then just like one catches his eye and he's like, see like, that, see that. No, I just like how he's gone into the, like gone into like public toilet and wrote, Reagan must die. And he's like, that'll fucking show them. That'll get me message out. Susan's going to be so proud of me. She's just like fucking withering away. <laughs> like, I feel so weak. And so before long, he was writing down his and Suzanne, <laughs> like his and Suzanne's like manifesto thing. And in his scribbles, he condemned President Reagan and his administration, as well as religions he thought had too much power as a result of deals with the devil. As he wrote, Michael realized that what his true destiny was to convert the world and to make them see the truth. Right. So he would hold Suzanne up as the prophet while he did this. He knew. <laughs> To be caught up in his newfound calling, it was several days before Michael remembered his wife was starving in the woods. (laughs) Just forgot about it. Like, oh shit. He's like, like, and Suzanne, my wife will be the... Oh shit, she's starving in the woods in Oregon. Oh, she's going to be so pissed if she's still alive. He'd been gone for over a week, and even though God had ordered the fast, it was still a long time to be without food. Panicked, he started north. Along the way, he dug through dumpsters, picking through trash for scraps to bring back to his wife. Oh, she is not going to be happy. Back at the cabin, Susan was on the verge of starvation. The lack <laughs> Imagine of food- that, he'd get us back. Good news. New mark pens. Bad news. Here's a bit of mouldy cheese. Sorry, a rat snibbled on it. Also, I have now, I've now got hepatitis. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah she was in a delusional state through hunger and she interpreted these as an intensification of her psychic visions but things she saw weren't at all pleasant imagine that being starved to death in and the dark- also on drugs I know yeah in the d- darkness of the woods the devil and his servants had visited Suzanne toying with her already tenuous grip on sanity ghosts and witches appeared to torment her <laughs> before the devil himself arrived to possess the 39 year old By the time Michael returned, two weeks after he left, Suzanne was shouting incoherently, screaming at people and monsters he couldn't see. (laughs) I'm sorry, it's not funny. But with some food, she soon came back to reality, and the couple shared their recent experiences with each other. She's like, I was was starving, and the devil, what did you do? Stole some marker pens, right? I went to a toilet, I wrote, Reagan must die, and Alu Akbar, right? Yeah, and then I started writing down what we should do, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I remembered you were starving, so I uh, hitchhiked back and went through loads of dumpsters. How long was he fucking in? gone? Two weeks. Fuck Two sake. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> what so, a dick. 
So Michael was excited to share his newfound calling with Suzanne and filled in on his plan to evangelize Islam throughout Los Angeles and hopefully the world. All great religions needed a scribe, he told her, and he was theirs. He committed the task of writing and distributing a manifesto that would surely change the world. With his new mark pens. With his new mark pens. <laughs> and bits of scraps of paper that he pulled out the dumpster. Like pizza boxes with grease on. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> this is what would at last inside the Holy War, he declared. Their mission of hunting remained unchanged, but now he knew why they needed to preach their message as they went. It was also clear that it was a clarity of purpose the couple had lacked until that moment and propelled them forward with a fresh supply of food and motivated them to carry on their twisted mission. They were ready to march into war. <laughs> oh, sorry. It just makes me laugh. <laughs> just how he's just like left it for two weeks. Just to I know. Work, forgot about I know. Him. It's just like he's there in fucking Venice Beach. <laughs> it's like working out. <laughs> <laughs> just like yeah, you can have some drugs. Yeah, like, oh. making friends with the hippie community. Like, yeah, he's just, just like, like oh, do you know who likes drugs? My wow. Oh fuck. Heads to the light fucking toilet, scrolls it on the door, just like she ever visits here. She'll know, she'll know. I was trying, I was trying really hard. Anyway, <laughs> you're gonna like this bit less. I'm, I'm liking all of this, yeah, but no, this bit's gonna make you laugh even more. In the summer of 1981, Susanna Michael received a sign from God. It was time to move on, Les. It was uh, again, again. Time that sign came again. in the form of a park ranger ordering them off their land to stop stealing picnic baskets. Fucking kidding me. No, he was literally they stopped. Were... No, they weren't stealing picnic baskets, but it was a park ranger telling him to move on, like the park ranger used to with Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was, this also proves that God was not subtle. <laughs> so, taking the hints from above, the couple packed their things and hitchhiked to the southwest since their only source of income was selling weed. Suzanne had Michael visit the weed growing acquaintances in Northern California, and he begged them for a stash to take on their journey, promising he'd pay them back later. Then, in the later half of 1981, the couple travelled through Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado selling marijuana. While Michael worked on his... How much weed did they give him? I don't know. I wasn't there. So while Michael worked on his manifesto, he wrote down everything he knew about their religion, which mostly came from Suzanne. So the fledgling text included descriptions of Suzanne's visions and her instructions how to best kill witches, as well as ramblings about current world order. Remember, the best way to kill witches, hit them with a pan. World governments and religions were under control. Hit them with a pan. Bunk, bunk. Bunk, bunk, stab, stab. Yeah. Quang. World governments and religions were under the control of the devil, Michael wrote, and the only way to effect change was through holy war and apocalypse. They tell you to register to vote. The pair decided this would come in the form of a nuclear holocaust. So the book acted as an instructional text how to set off the event, invade the Ukraine. I bet Vladimir Putin's got this manifesto. Mostly the instructions took the form of a list of assassination targets whose deaths would surely trigger a massive world war. The lineup, right, these aren't bad. Right. Lineup included Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul, Johnny Carson, and of course, Ronald Reagan. I don't know what Johnny Carson's done there. No. Michael and Suzanne zeroed in on these targets and they believe that them to be at odds with their religious agenda. It was a familiar move that many religious fundamentalists and terrorists have used to drive engagement to their ideals. In an article in the Political Psychology Journal, Dr. Valmiki Vulcan argues that people develop their sense of self in relation to their perceived enemies and allies. The more that a person feels their political or religious beliefs are being threatened, the more they'll fixate on their enemies, which is quite yeah. true. Yeah. So by calling for the elimination of world leaders and other prominent mm. figures, it's possible that Michael and Suzanne hope to defend their beliefs, consolidate their power and spread their ideas even further. Then again, it's also possible that the pair weren't possessed and the forethought needed for that kind of planning. So they did it. maybe they were just making things up as they went along with their resounding calls to action, rounding out their vision. The manifesto was complete around the same time in early 1982 that the pair ran out of money. Weird, man. Decided the best thing to do was head back to California with copies of their manuscript under their arms. 
Along with seeking converts on their way of thinking, the pair were also on the hunt for a new income source. And as it had been their habit for the past year, they likely they likely follow the dr- drug supply chain, hoping to kill two birds with one stone, hitchhiking through California. They were picked up by a local driver who kindly offered them a place to stay on his property. The man, Patrick, enjoyed the odd couple's company so much he agreed to take marijuana in lieu of rent. <laughs> I mean, if, you could, if you're going to have like this weird religious couple, and uh, I've got no money, I've got this weed, do, do you know what? I like you. You make me laugh. This fucking pizza box that's got a manifesto on it. He's fucking cracking it. You know what? Give me weed. You can stay. So <laughs> Deep in the woods, the treehouse stood near makeshift structures and tents in something of a commune. Michael and Suzanne were delighted with the setup. Not only did they have a place to stay, but Patrick seemed like an ideal new disciple. If they could bring him into the fold and he, when he dropped them off at the cabin, they invited him to stay in a while enjoy the evening but that night as the three agents smoked around the fire Suzanne felt a shift Patrick she decided was getting too close to comfort just like Karen he was trying to come between her and Michael and she couldn't allow that she abandoned her plans to convert Patrick and instead became aggressive towards their friendly host she screamed at him to leave them alone ordering him off his own property and bewildered by his behaviour Michael asked Susan what was wrong that was when she told them the truth Patrick was a witch. The next morning, Patrick returned to tell his guests to leave, but they'd already given him payment for their month. And Michael and Suzanne refused to like, dude, we gave you weed. You know, we're here for a few more days. After Suzanne's erratic behaviour, it seems likely that Patrick was too scared to press the issue. So Michael and Suzanne stayed for a couple of weeks and then settled into the quirky community in the woods and they peddled the last of their weed to the locals in exchange for other essentials but didn't make any friends and because Suzanne was just too aggressive and bizarre. <laughs> like always, Suzanne's aggression stemmed from a paranoid belief that evil was all around her during their time living in Big Sur Woods. She confided in Michael, everyone around them was a witch. It's like, everyone's a witch. Yes, everyone's a witch, Susan. So when Patrick and a friend of his returned to order them to leave, they didn't put up much resistance surrounded by the servants of the devil. They could never be happy here. She's like, I don't care. You're all witches. I can't be happy here. You know, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And I'm going to start a holy war on my own with Michael. You're not coming, Patrick. No. Fuck you, Patrick. They left, but planned to come back the next day. Michael, but they did plan to come back the next day. So Michael and Suzanne used what little money they had to buy supplies from a gas station. Gasoline, rags, soda bottles, and in a dingy motel room, they made Molotov cocktails and ready themselves to burn the witches in the fading light. Oh my God. The pair returned to the woods, moving quietly through the brush. It was dark by the time they made it to the cabin, but it wouldn't be for long. Michael lit the first bomb and tossed it at the treehouse. Within seconds, flames danced through the wooden structure while Suzanne cackled with delight. <laughs> I'll get you! You little no, dog, she, too! She's not a witch. She's killing witches. I don't care if it fits. <gasps> the next target was Patrick's cabin, a short walk away. Frustrated that the door was locked so he couldn't get in to rub the place, Michael set fire to the cabin's porch and then moved on. He's just like, shit! I'm not getting in. Fuck you. <laughs> As he wandered through the trees, he stopped into an empty tent and poked around. In sound, he found a thirty-eight caliber pistol and pocketed it. Is that mine? Satisfied with the carnage, Michael and Suzanne retreated, tossing one last bomb into the tent of a particularly nasty couple, which they were proud of their efforts. Just like, bitch. Sure, they'd struck a great blow as warriors of God, and it was sure to send a signal to the witches along the coast that skilled hunters were on their tails, throwing petrol bombs stealing guns. But in reality, Michael and Suzanne didn't manage to harm anyone with a sneak attack. The <laughs> fires destroyed several structures on Patrick's property, but no people, witches, or otherwise were hurt in this in that action. Still confident they were on the right path, Michael and Suzanne continued their journey through California, eventually arriving in Humboldt County in the spring of 1982. The area was populated with doomsday preppers and more than a few marijuana plantations, which seemed to be a perfect fit for the Bear Carsons in this peaceful slice of paradise. <laughs> they found work and accommodation on a cannabis farm, but there were other people living and working on the property, and Michael and Suzanne didn't play well with others. They, no, no. The intensive labour in the West Coast heat shortened everyone's <clears throat> views, and the newcomers were quickly at odds with all of their new colleagues. 
Unsurprisingly, their co-workers described the couple as lunatics and troublemakers, as the pair always seemed out for a fight. Suzanne took umbrage with the community's farming techniques and secular lifestyle, as well as anything else that annoyed her, though no one... You know, it's just anything really with her, ain't it? No one liked her, really. And, you know, through that, get, like, you know, through association, Michael. Mm-hmm. They were tolerated, but things took a turn for the worse when 26-year-old Clark Stevens arrived at the plantation. Now, Clark was a friend and recent business partner of the farm's owner and ruffled feathers as soon as he got there. Predictably, Michael and Suzanne were particularly annoyed by Clark, who they found arrogant. He was also from Los Angeles, which is a city infected by witches, of course. Therefore, he represented the corruption and the evils of the modern world. It wasn't long before disagreements between Michael and Clark devolved into screaming matches. Unlike many of the farm's other workers, Clark was as stubborn as Michael and refused to back down. At one stage, Clark insulted Suzanne while her husband wasn't around, which infuriated him. She rushed to tell Michael and Cl- about Clark's blatant disrespect, claiming that by insulting a woman, Clark spat on the Islam and their adjacent faith. <laughs> she told Michael that it was duty- his duty to defend her honour and reminded him that God gave him a gun. It wasn't God really, was it? Michael just nicked it. For this very reason, this was a test, she insisted, with the proper weapon to use against their enemy. There was no acceptable excuse for inaction, Michael. So one morning in May 1982, Michael stuck his pistol in the back of his jeans and headed out to work early in the day. The couple bumped into Clark out on the farm, telling him they needed to talk. They led him to a secluded corner of the property when they were out of earshot of the others. Michael pointed the gun at Clark, and the excitement of the moment was too much for Suzanne, who cackled and screamed, urging her husband on. She <laughs> kill him! He obeyed her orders and squeezed the trigger several times. With her enemy motionless at their feet, Suzanne insisted on burning the body, because... You've got to burn a witch. That's the only way you can kill a witch. You burn it. Or throw water on them. It gets yeah. confusing. You just burn them. Burn them. Yeah. That'll do it for most burn things, her. won't it? No. Yeah. So, as ever, Suzanne produced a can of kerosene and splashed on Clark's bloody corpse with glee. They drop a lit match and watch the flames consume his flesh when the body burns. When the body would burn no longer, they covered the remains in fertiliser and turned around to leave. They spent two nervous days working as if nothing was wrong. But eventually their anxiety got the best of them and packed their few possessions and ran. The couple laid low in a nearby town that evening and then when dawn came, they headed for the freeway to hitch a ride. But before they could convince a driver to give them a lift, a police car pulled up beside them while walking down the road somewhere in the woods of Northern California, trying to decide where to go next. So the trooper behind the wheel wanted directions to a local farm, the same plantation where they had just murdered Clark, and they panicked but hoped to buy themselves some time. The couple gave the cop incorrect directions and watched him drive off. They were like, oh, you mean Northern Farm? In the north of the district? Yeah, that's one. It's down south, that way. So, <laughs> sure, they, if they'd, been cu- they'd be caught if they stayed on the roads, so Michael and Suzanne opted to head into the woods on foot. They cap- camped under the stars that night, perhaps hoping for the next morning to bring the perfect chance to slip away from Humboldt County. But to their horror, they awoke to sounds of the authorities combing through the woods. The search party was looking for a lost hiker, but the killer couple were sure the cops were after them. Michael and Suzanne bolted in different directions, not stopping to pick up their bags. Desperate to escape, Suzanne ran deeper into the woods until uniformed searchers were out of sight, while Michael ran back towards the road. Within minutes, search dogs sniffed out their discarded backpacks. Inside, investigators found marijuana, bullets, a stolen ID, and the rambling religious manuscript bearing the author's name, Michael Bear. There was little of note in the photocopy pages except for extensive lists of assassination targets. After an attempt on the president's life the previous year, the cops weren't taking any chances and reported the find to higher authorities. Whoever he was, Michael Baer was now a national security threat. Well. (laughs) I mean, it's... I mean, how is this guy a national security threat? Oh, anyway. So, police logged the fingerprints that were pulled from the manuscript and they couldn't find any record of the text. So, so it turns out Michael never legally changed his name from James Carson. It seemed, because they were looking for Michael Bear with these yeah. fingerprints, right? But he'd never changed his name legally from James Carson. So he believed Suzanne's proclamation of his new name was official enough. Because, you no. Know, 
Why not? But despite the confusion, Michael's true identity was becoming clearer. Across town, a dog discovered Clark Stevens' charred remains and police were called in. Michael's name came up a lot during police inv- interviews with the farm workers. And he quickly shot to the top of a short list of suspects. It was him and Boo Boo. So, however, <laughs> while investigators <laughs> thought they were closing in on Clark's murderer, Mark was already in Los Angeles, hundreds of miles from Humboldt County. And he breathed easy. Sure, he'd escaped suspicion. He might have felt relaxed as he walked through the Alhambra in the city's east. But his peace wasn't to last without warning. Police swam, swam the 31-year-old, ordering him to put his hands up when he was bundled into the back of a cop car. He felt sure it was all over. Somehow they'd found him. Still, he wasn't going to make it easier for them. During a quick pat-down, the arresting officer somehow missed the pistol tucked into his pants. Thinking quickly, he pulled the gun out and hid it in the back of the police cruiser. Oh. Because that's a good job there, LAPD. Yeah. Once at the station, he gave a fake name. What's your name? Hugh Mann. And he posed for a photograph, and he's like, uh, <laughs> before he was led into an interrogation room to await questioning. When detectives arrived to interview him at last, it was clearly had no idea about Michael's actual crimes. He had been arrested in the hunt for a rape suspect. Able to answer truthfully on this point, Michael asserted his innocence of the crime, but otherwise stayed quiet. It didn't take long for the victim to rule Michael out of there as their attacker. Like, shit, no, I've not done that. He was like, no, I haven't raped anyone. Just killed a couple of witches. You know, panned him. Well, no. Panned and burnt him. He was like, you panned a witch? Yeah, he was like, quang. But with that, he was free to go. <laughs> Realising it was a mistake to come to LA, he was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And he hitched right out there. Once again, the police were one step behind Michael. While he escaped Los Angeles, an officer found the gun he'd hidden in the p- patrol car. Realising it had been a mistake to let him go, the LAPD sent out a statewide all-points bulletin. Only they sent it out using the fake name he gave at the station, Richard Arata. Richard Arata. Richard Arata. Arata. For fuck's sake, Michael. <laughs> That's fucking genius. So, six... <laughs> his name's James Carson. They're looking for Michael Bear, but his name, he thinks his name's Michael Bear, but they're looking for Richard Arata. Does he do that purposely? Yeah. He was like, yeah, what's your name? Richard Arata. <clears throat> That's... That's br- That's genius. Yes, man. Richard Arata? So, 600 (laughs) miles away in Humboldt County, officers recognised that name from the stolen ID they pulled from Michael's backpack. Working in tandem, the two police departments matched the ballistics from Clark Stevens' murder to Michael's gun. But by the time the results came back, he was in the wind. In fact, Michael was on his way to meet Suzanne at a pre-arranged spot in Sonora, about 100 miles east east of San Francisco. Only a week after they made their frantic split, Michael and Susan were reunited, and it felt so good. (laughs) <laughs> it might have seemed like a good time to lay low and let the heat die down but Suzanne never met a good idea she didn't like so she insisted that her visions were signalling the beginning of the holy war they couldn't fear capture she told Michael not now they had the chance to usher in the end of days it seems that the recent close calls the couple worried they'd never get the chance to complete their grand plan but they were prophets of course and of course. they were sure that it was going to bring about the holy war and it had to be now and if that was made them martyrs, why not? Waiting for things to happen wasn't their style, so they hit the road once again. Suzanne's psychic compass directed them to the city of Portland. After staying with a friend for a few weeks, they achieved nothing of note. <laughs> well, they just didn't kill anyone. Or starve. Or steal marker pens. Sensing the city was, wasn't the right place for them, the couple stole the thirty eight caliber pistol and fled. But something pulled them back to California by the end of 1982. So, this is seven months after Clark Stevens made it. They returned. And now, after losing the gun in the LA, Michael is armed again. Okay, they wandered hopelessly down a highway near Bakersfield on January the 11th. Car after car just went straight past him, wanting nothing to do with this fucking crazy, unwashed fucking make weird couple so until a truck made a sudden u-turn and headed back their way when they he approached suzanne whispered to michael that the driver 30 year old john haller was a witch this is like his trigger word it is it's it, like, isn't it like oh, what well, well, the guy who um, murdered um rfk um was it saran saran i can't remember his name something like that um, they think he was an agent because they saw a woman 
running off from him going like, we killed it, we've done it, we, we assassinated Kennedy. And they think he was like a sleeper agent and they gave him a word. So he went and killed him because he says he's got no Did recollection. Did you say RFK? Yeah, Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy, his brother. Oh, so not JFK? No. Oh, okay, cool. His brother, because he was assassinated. They were both assassinated. Yeah, he was shot in a kitchen. There you go. Didn't know that. Yeah, so anyway, this dude, right? Um, John Hellier, he's a witch. They need to kill him. And they haven't killed many witches lately, have they? Was there something to do possibly with, like, he'd, I mean, it was convenient that he was a witch, but could it be that he had a truck? Possibly, but are you going to argue with the prophet? No. No. Now, Allah had rewarded their patience by delivering a demon right to them. It's funny that, isn't it? Often the witches Suzanne chose were strangers with whom they'd cross paths. In this case, John was generous, not offering not only them to drive them to his destination of Santa Rosa, but to let them crash at his friend's place. That's nice of you. Yeah. But your friend gets out, he's like, what the fuck are you all these here for? Yet this act of kindness did nothing to dispel Susan's random hatred for him. So unsurprisingly, criminal psychologist Dr. Eric Hickey describes Susan and Michael's crimes as spontaneous and opportunistic. Like other serial killers, they weren't predators in the traditional sense. Suzanne's shifting criteria for what defined a witch made their attacks impossible to anticipate. And on that cool January day, something about John Hellier sparked Suzanne's vitriol. So, Fucking hell, Suzanne. Before she even met him, she decided he had to die. They squeezed into his truck and Suzanne and Michael weren't shy about berating their driver. They nitpicked his music choices and driving style. Little things like that hurt them. But when John's leg brushed against Susan's on the seat, she knew he deserved to die. But not yet. Firstly, the couple happily accepted an offer for a place to stay. The following morning, Susan was ready to kill him. They'd only driven a short way when her eyes flashed to Michael, which he knew was a sign to attack. He reached across the seat and yanked the steering wheel hard to the right. John struggled to regain control of the vehicle, but put his hands up when Michael pulled out his gun. When the truck came to stop on the shoulder, John leapt out of it in a desperate attempt to escape but not willing to let the witch go Michael and Suzanne gave chase while Michael paced them aiming the gun at John Suzanne snuck up behind their victim pulling a knife from her bag John's eyes were still trained on the pistol in Michael's hand while Suzanne slipped in the knife into his back delighted with her role in the attack Susan darted away leaving Michael a clear shot but he hesitated and John seized his chance and he ran around the car trying to keep it between himself and his attackers for around 10 minutes, the three chased each other around the truck. <laughs> yeah, fucking Benny Hill style. Like, do, 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 do. <laughs> for fuck's sake. All the while, while this was happening, onlookers slowed to see what the fuck was going on before driving off during the standoff. Suzanne managed to stab John a few more times before Michael finally pulled the trigger. With Suzanne egging him on, he shot John several times. By then, one of the passing drivers had managed to alert the police to the situation. As Michael and Suzanne stood glowingly over John's lifeless corpse, the distant sound of sirens pierced the freeway buzz. Hearing and hearing the cops, Susan dragged John's body off the side of the road and rushed back to the truck. As soon as Michael flung himself into the passenger seat, she peeled out of there, perhaps sending up a prayer that they'd escaped, escaped capture once again. But the cops were hot on their heels. They'd found John Hellier's body within minutes and police radios across the city announced that the killers were driving a stolen truck. This chase lasted the length of two counties before patrol cars finally closed in on the witch killers. Distracted by blaring sirens and flashing lights, Suzanne lost control of the truck and crashed into a ditch. <coughs> in desperation, Suzanne and Michael abandoned the useless car and darted into the woods nearby. However, they didn't make it far past the tree line before they were last apprehended in the aftermath of their arrest. The truth about Michael and Suzanne's identities came to light. In addition to charges from John Hellier's murder, they were also tied to Clark Stevens, slain the previous year. As the case pressed in on into spring of 1983, Susan refused to cooperate with her lawyer or say anything at their pre-trial hearings. Of course, of course. For his part, it seems Michael was disappointed with the lack of press attention he and Suzanne had received. Perhaps he'd hoped their arrest would draw people to their cause, but he had no such luck when things didn't move the way he wanted. Michael took drastic action, and in March of 1983, he brokered a deal. He confessed to the 1981 murder of Karen Barnes, which police hadn't yet tied to the couple, 
<laughs> in exchange, he demanded a chance to speak to the media at a press conference. Negotiations took weeks, but terms were eventually agreed upon. Michael and Suzanne would get their moment in the spotlight. So in April of 1983, journalists from Santa Rosa and San Francisco gathered at the jail to attend the promised press conference. Not, no one knew quite what to expect, but they hoped there might be enough for a small story or two. But as things got going, Michael showed no signs of letting the event end early. He rambled about his and Suzanne's religion, its complexities and its need for a holy war. He spoke of the evils of the witches and Suzanne's psychic visions. Michael spoke for at least six hours, detailing the entirety of their faith and the brutal details of each murder. It's unclear how much footage from the conference was released to the public, but it seems that the witch hunters finally felt they'd received the attention they deserved. Suzanne sat quietly next to Michael, a silent observer. In the end, she had led him to this moment. He had found a cause to champion. Theirs was a perfect match, despite the public confession. The couple pleaded not guilty to Karen's murder when he went to trial in 1984, claiming self-defence. When a jury returned a guilty verdict, Michael yelled down with the quick. Down with the Queen, repeatedly. What? Meanwhile, Suzanne stood up and screamed, What is my crime? To be beautiful? Really? Is that what she said? (laughs) To be an artist for the crimes of murder, not beauty or art? Susan and Michael tried two more times and were sentenced to three live sentences each. A jury of their peers declared them guilty, but that wasn't enough to convince the killer couple that they were wrong. Their plan to rid the world of evil was just because they maintained it was right. It was God's will, but it seems more than likely that God willed Susan and Michael to die behind bars. They remain in their separate prisons to this day. She has no one to lead, and he has no cause to champion. They are merely alone. And thus sends the ballad of the San Francisco Witch Killers. Good one, that was, wasn't it, Les? That's, that's, uh, that's a new fave. <clears throat> How is this not a film? I think it's... This, this should fucking be. It reminds... If it's going to be a film, it reminds me of that film Rat Race, where uh, you got all those people going across the country, and you got um, the guy in the steel... It is a bit of... And they stick, steal Hitler's car. And it's got that, like... And then she get, goes in there, and he's got lipstick in there, and she's like, oh, she goes, she might have terrible taste in men, but Eva Brown's got great taste in lipstick. He's like, stop, he's like, put down Hitler's wife's lipstick. When they go to the Barbie museum. <laughs> <laughs> when she's like, turn around for the Barbie Museum, and he's like, no, no, we've got it, and she just fucking headbutts him. That's the, yeah, uh, that's one of the nuns from Sister Act, isn't it? Yeah. Like, um, what's that band that plays at the end who did that song that was in fucking everything during the late 90s? Can't remember. It was a Shrek. But no. Oh, Smash Mouth. Smash Mouth, that's them. No, but like somebody should seriously fucking yeah. I would like this. That was mint. Like a lot of the way through that, I was just like, "Oh god!" You thought it peaked with Yogi Bear, didn't you? I thought it peaked, but it just kept getting better and better. So then, yes, that was the San Francisco Witch Killers. And let us know what you think about that. Was that one of your favourites? You know, were they right? Is everyone a witch? Have you got psychic powers and you think you're a witch? Let us know. But um, yeah, if you did enjoy that, um, please let us know. Please like, share and subscribe. Just do it, please. Helps us with the algorithm and, you know. Yeah, because they definitely don't fucking push us. They don't. They don't push us at all. I'm surprised you found us if you're a new person. Um, Oh, a big shout out to um, somebody, uh, Whiskey Coyote, who's been watching, who's been watched, binge watched. All our videos on YouTube in about a week. Whiskey Coyote? Yeah, well done. What a fucking awesome Commented name. on everyone, liked all the videos, and they were gutted that we run out. Here's some more videos for you. Pixie something as well. Shout out to her. Pixie. Fire Pixie. Fire Pixie. She's a good egg. She's one of my subscribers. She's good. She's good in this Fire Pixie. Thanks for humoring but yeah, um, if you do like, um, want to help us out, you can subscribe to us on Patreon by going to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark and just pledging. Give us some money and it helps us get new shit. And also, if you want to donate to our charity raising, charity raising, money f- fundraising for charity, which is a refuge, the domestic help, 
domestic abuse. I can't fucking speak. It's the witches. Refuge the domestic. For fuck's sake. It's witches. The witches. The witches. It's the kid next door. Can kill him. Can hear him speaking. Um, yeah, um, if you do want to help out, it's Refuge, a domestic violence charity here in the UK. You can do by going to justgiving.com slash fundraising slash enter the dark and just get anything that you can, even if it's just like a dollar, 50 cents, or if you don't live in America and you have proper money and also, you know, the metric system, whatever you want. Um, yeah, just... Well, I mean, you're right. I might. I'm always right. Um, but yeah, um, mm. just do that, please. If you want to reach out to us, you can do it by going to um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The witches are really fucking with my head. I can't control this. Um, yeah, email us on enterthedartpodcast at gmail.com. And also just just get in touch and chat to us and we'll have a laugh like we usually do. Yeah, yeah. We like sharing memes. Um, yes, thank you for... All your support is, we do appreciate it lots. I know we joke about it, but we do really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, yes, I hope you enjoyed it. I've been Jan. He's been Les. Take care. Burn the witch.